For more than 50 years, top cognitive scientists, machine learning researchers, and even software engineers worked toward the ultimate goal in education, a complex AI system that employed pedagogical rigor, brain simulation, and human empathy to be the perfect teacher. It would be called an intelligent tutoring system. So far, it hasn't really happened. But if we take a closer look at the attempts to build it, there's actually something else to be found. For decades, top scientists worked through research on human learning and tried to consolidate it into well-defined modular software. If we're motivated students who want to create our own learning system, instead of reading thousands of research papers, how about we copy this software? We'll break this into two parts. In the first part, we'll look at the academic literature on intelligent tutoring systems. In the second part, we'll cover takeaways from that literature. We'll talk about how we can create our own intelligent tutoring system using tools like ChatGPT, mind maps, and revision timetables. Throughout, I'll be using the Infinite Canvas in the Omni app to explain. An intelligent tutoring system is a program. Like most programs, it has an interface, logic, and state which we could also call view, controller, and model. The learner interacts with the interface, for example, through dialogue. From the interaction, the controller updates the state, reads the state, and comes up with a response for the learner. But that's pretty much how all software works. What makes it intelligent? Typically, an intelligent tutoring system will have some model of the mind. Actually, it will have a model of an expert's mind, called the domain model, and then try to keep a model of the student's mind, called the student model. Over time, we should see the student become like the expert. A popular model to use is called ACTR, or Adaptive Control of Thought Rational. ACTR is a symbolic representation of the mind because of the way human programmed logic in each module works. But it also draws inspiration from connectionist models of the mind, like neural networks, by strengthening and weakening neural connections as memories are retrieved. Theoretically, some modules correspond to different parts of the brain. For example, the temporal module maps to the cortex, the declarative module maps to the prefrontal cortex, and the imaginal module maps to the parietal lobe. Practically, the modules come together to simulate and predict student behavior. The goal module holds the student's current goal so that other modules can access it. Memory is organized into declarative and procedural. Declarative memory is organized into chunks that represent information like facts and events. A chunk could represent information about Luis, or it could represent an arithmetic fact, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Each chunk has associated values that determine how long it takes to retrieve it. The more we access a chunk, the more that connection is strengthened, and the faster it is to access. Following the fan effect, the more information we have connected to one item, the longer it takes to retrieve any connected fact. Following the forgetting curve, connections are weakened, and retrieval takes longer when we haven't accessed a chunk for a while. Procedural memory consists of logical rules called productions, which perform actions based on a condition. To perform a task, we should choose a production based on the current goal, the production's condition, and state from other modules. With these components of memory, retrieval, learning, and performing tasks, we can simulate the knowledge and actions of an expert, the current knowledge of a student, and even common mistakes a student might make. Okay, ultimately ACTR is just a model. How do we measure the actual progress a student is making? We want to know where the student is on their way to becoming an expert. For everything the student needs to learn, we could kind of imagine progress bars that show how far along the student is from not learned to learned. Connecting this back to ACTR, each bar could be how well a student follows an expert production rule that represents procedural knowledge. In Bayesian statistics, we would call this updating the posterior as we gather evidence. The more often a student behaves the same way as our expert model, the more likely it is that they've learned. We can track more than skills. We can also track personal state, like motivation and emotions. Moving from 1D progress bars to a multi-dimensional space 
it's clear that we're working on a state estimation problem, where the interaction between the student and the model moves the state from one point to the next, hopefully in the right direction. If that doesn't sound difficult enough, we further have to think about the temporal element, skill dependencies, and the topology of problem-skill relationships, or item theory. Imagine the student is studying arithmetic, and we ask them a bunch of practice questions on the topic, like 3 plus 3. These questions will correspond to skills or productions they're learning, like addition. Each question can incorporate multiple skills, and each skill can depend on other skills. When the student provides an answer, we can update their estimated state. We might want to take into account the order of questions and the forgetting curve while updating. Notice that this is looking more and more like a machine learning problem. Given features that include information about the student and their responses to problems at previous time steps, can we predict what will happen in the next time step? The temporal nature of this data is perfect for transformers and recurrent neural networks. However, transparency of the model for humans points toward more handcrafted Bayesian models. If that sounds cool, you might be a machine learning researcher in the 2020s. If you're scratching your head and thought this video was about human learning, you might be a cognitive scientist from the 1980s. Around the 1980s, the field of intelligent tutoring systems started to move away from behavioral and information processing paradigms and toward a constructivist paradigm. In other words, a vision started to form of AI that enables student exploration and inquiry and acted more like a coach consultant, or problem-solving monitor. In this paradigm, motivation for learning and the content of a curriculum could come directly from a student's exploration. To help direct this exploration, we can make the learning goal-oriented. In project-based learning, a student takes on an open-ended task that requires procedural knowledge and develops an output. In problem-based learning, a student takes on an open-ended question that requires deep declarative knowledge and higher-order thinking to form an answer. In case-based learning, students simulate real-world scenarios to drive real-world learning. In all of these goal-oriented scenarios, we want the student in charge. Here's an analogy with constructing a building. Unhelpful AI is like a robot that does all the building. Helpful AI is like scaffolding around the build site. It's there to support the builder and help them get to the right place, but lets the builder construct the building. In fact, in cognitive science, this helpful support is called scaffolding. Okay, now we have a problem or a project that motivates our learning and defines a curriculum. But in what order do we traverse the curriculum? In intelligent tutoring systems, the main logic is called the pedagogical model. The pedagogical model has access to the curriculum in some form of modular units. Traditionally, these might be really small, like individual practice questions, video clips, or diagrams, but we'll revisit that later. A naive algorithm might determine the order in which students learn each unit. However, that's missing the bigger picture. The goal, like we've talked about, is to help the student reach mastery on each skill. That way, they can move on to the next set of skills or the next grade. We call this mastery learning. To achieve mastery in an optimal way, we probably want to think a lot bigger. First, we should predict how much learning gain we would get from each unit. It's a bit like desirable difficulty. Based on the student's current knowledge, certain units will have higher returns. Something too difficult won't help much, and neither will something too easy. The obvious next step would be to use a greedy algorithm and choose the unit with the highest predicted learning gain at each time step. But let's think bigger again. We know students have a forgetting curve and need to review material with spacing we might expect students to prefer smooth changes in difficulty. And lastly, we want to keep students engaged and motivated. This depends on the student, but it could involve anything from brief exploration of fresh material to freebies that boost the ego. Thus, our ideal pedagogical model is globally optimal and thinks about students' long-term journey to mastery. However, even if our algorithms are optimal, they won't be useful if the student can't learn the units. Learning each unit is a two-sided problem. The algorithm has to correctly communicate information, and the student has to correctly process information. With intelligent tutoring systems, the interface includes some type of dialogue, like a chat, 
In an ideal dialogue, the student finds or develops the knowledge instead of being told the knowledge. Students can actually find the knowledge internally through reason. This is called a Socratic dialogue. In a Socratic dialogue, the tutor probes the student's mental model and prompts the student to perform higher order reasoning. Through that reasoning, the student self-corrects misconceptions and gaps in their mental model. Ultimately, the student will learn the topic, but also learn to accept real-world uncertainty and personal re-evaluation. We can make Socratic dialogue more rigorous at multiple levels. The conversation itself can follow a five-step tutoring frame, which includes a problem proposition, a first answer, first feedback, discussion, and then a final diagnosis. Within the discussion itself, we can follow best practices for conversational turn management, initiating with positive, neutral, or negative feedback, advancing the discussion with hints, prompts, assertions, and corrections, and cueing replies to keep the conversation going. Instead of looking internally, the student can find answers externally. The student could use the scientific method, design thinking, data analysis, or synthesis of primary sources to reach their own conclusions. Finally, there's a really effective middle ground called modeling. The teacher performs a demo, lets the student try, and then provides scaffolding that fades as the student improves. One of my favorite examples of this is reciprocal teaching. Here, a student and teacher keep switching their roles back and forth. The teacher gets the opportunity to model higher order thinking through teaching, and the student gets the opportunity to practice higher order thinking through teaching. The ideal intelligent tutoring system that we've looked at has a lot going for it, but it's still narrow AI that only works in one domain. What are the academics missing here? What differentiates narrow, static AI from Terminator-level singularity is the ability to self-improve. Right now, the best way for an intelligent tutoring system to improve is for humans to make minor tweaks to the algorithm over time, based on data. The idea behind the singularity is that humans can create a seed AI with the engineering capabilities to improve itself. Eventually, through self-improvement, the AI will surpass human intelligence, reach the singularity, and then reach superintelligence. The takeaway here isn't about the Terminator. The takeaway is that self-improvement, metacognition, and reflection are important aspects of both human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Tutoring systems, as we've described, don't account for any of this. But don't worry, we will. Now that we've made it this far, let's take everything we've learned from the deep literature on intelligent tutoring systems and try to apply it ourselves. Here's the thing. Like a lot of research and education, intelligent tutoring systems are kind of for children. The main component is called a pedagogical model. The word pedagogy has its roots in Greek and means something like to lead a child. We probably care more about andragogy, which is facilitated adult learning, or hudagogy, which is self-directed learning. If you're watching this video, you're probably self-motivated, independent, and actually want to learn. That can't be said about the average child. What I want to explore is, what if we took all of this knowledge from intelligent tutoring systems, plus modern tools like ChatGPT, Omni, and Anki, and let self-motivated adults control their own learning. What would that look like? The following is my personal opinion. It's not from the literature, but it will clearly connect. We said that intelligent tutoring systems organize a curriculum into units. Usually they're small, like individual problems. For us, we can have units at multiple levels. The top level might be individual college courses. Within a course, we might create modules from learning objectives or chapters. Within a module, we can have lower level units like facts and skills. We can drive our motivation and create the curriculum based on inquiry with projects, problems, and cases. At the top level, this could be an undergraduate thesis. For an individual course, this could be a final project. At the module level, this could be past papers and small projects. And at the lowest level, this could be individual practice problems. So for any of these units at any of these levels, we're following the same pattern, just scaled up to the size of the unit. Therefore, we can talk a little more abstractly about this pattern. Given a unit at some level, we drive our learning with inquiry, like projects. We can begin a unit with a pretest and end with a post-test. In addition to forward and backward testing effects, 
that lets us measure our learning gains, like an intelligent tutor would do. In addition to test measurements, we can keep track of our state and knowledge with a mind map. Like ACTR that models the student brain, the mind map is a representation of our current mental model. At the lowest fact level, we can use Anki to track our current knowledge. At the higher module level, we can use Omni's revision board and annotate each module with a color that represents our mastery. Both of these take into account the temporal aspect of the forgetting curve. Within a unit, we can learn with both dialogue-based and static material-based methods. For dialogue, we can use ChatGPT or an expert when available. We can engage in Socratic dialogue in either direction. We can ask ChatGPT to model with scaffolding that fades over time. We can do reciprocal teaching and alternate teaching roles. And we can ask for cases and examples to work through collaboratively. For static material like videos and text, we should use all the normal best practices like summarizing, self-explaining, generating analogies, and the other usual suspects. As a quick aside, note that I didn't include mind map as a learning method. The learning methods are here on the left. The mind map is the representation of what we learned using those methods. Within a unit, we should decide how to use subunits. Rather than following the order from a textbook or course, we should intelligently decide on unit order and unit inclusion. We can base that decision on predicted learning gains, curiosity for exploration, and current motivation. Maybe most importantly, we can take this to another level and change our internal state based on our goals. If we're not currently motivated to learn a specific unit, we can change that by creating the appropriate problem or project to solve and even pretest on it. For example, let's say we're studying C++. We might not initially be interested in the nuance of polymorphism, but if we can create a project that needs polymorphism, and then fail at that project, we'll be very motivated to then learn and succeed. Lastly, we want to fill in that singularity gap we talked about. At the AI level, that means improving our learning system. At the human level, that means improving ourselves. In Omni, there are two tools for doing this. We first need a representation of our learning system. This is called a revision board template. It's essentially different checklists and notes to self for different subjects, like declarative subjects or procedural subjects. The idea is to write down your system at a module level and then improve that system constantly. To figure out how to improve the system, we can use the goal cycle. The goal cycle in Omni is a consistent way to reflect and apply established prompts, like the Gibbs cycle or the ERA cycle. The results of these cycles will be actions that we can take to improve our system or improve ourselves. We began this video by looking at the field of intelligent tutoring systems. It's impressive how much research on education that scientists and engineers have been able to compress and filter into programmable insights. We were able to take those insights and combine them with modern tools like ChatGPT, Omni, and Anki to build a system for highly motivated, self-improving students. This video can be interpreted very practically as a good base for a learning system, but I also hope at a meta level that it provides a peek into synthesis of primary sources and mental model representation on a canvas. If you want to support the channel, download the Omni app on the iPad App Store, try it out, and maybe even give it 5 stars. It really helps out.